Welcome to the 30th episode of Renegade Marketers Live, a show that promises to be long on marketing insights and short on overhyped buzzwords. We'll be drinking in the latest tactics and the coolest gin. Yep, this may be the only live marketing show that also features a gin tasting. This show is being live streamed by our friends at Restream. And if you want to drink along at home, today we're having a taste off between New Amsterdam and Nika coffee gins. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, uh, live from my home studio in New York City. Now, I've got a confession. Of the 12 chapters in my new book, Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands, the one that took the longest to write and the one that I'm most likely to rewrite first is chapter 10, Measure What Matters. It's not that any of my proposed metrics are wrong per se, it's just so hard to generalize. Last week I was on a podcast recording session and I was actually forced to concede that in a few certain circumstances, MQL, as in marketing qualified lead, might be a metric that could be useful. Now I had written off for that for dead, I have said that many times. Anyway, this gentleman opened my eyes to this importance of it. We also had Forrester's Ross Graber on a, on a CMO Huddle program, and he opened my eyes to this idea of share of opportunities, which is a critical metric for some companies that are selling replacement products or services into multi-year contracts. So I explain a little bit more on this a little bit later, but the key thing is investigating metrics, modifying metrics is something that is never going to go away. It is always something we're going to have to approve on. Um, and you're going to have to find the ones that are right for you or your organization. So to help you do that, we have three amazing CMOs with their own special takes on measurement. And with that, let's bring on Chris Willis, Chief Marketing and Pipeline Officer, that's important in this conversation, of Acrolinks. Hello, Chris. Happy New Year. Hi, how are you? Happy New Year to you as well. I am great. You are the only CMO I know who has the title Chief Pipeline Officer. Can you talk about that? I can. I can talk about that. Um, what we were setting out to do um, a year and a half, two years ago, was balance the today with the tomorrow. And so effectively, uh, CROs, heads of sales, are always pulled into the focus of this quarter. If we go back a couple of weeks, we're in the middle of end of Q4, sales is 100% focused on closing the year. The thing is, there's another year coming. There's, there's a Q1 that's gonna follow Q4. And somebody in the organization needs to live with that. And it makes sense that it's also the person that runs marketing because marketing impacts the future, not so much the now, but largely the future from a demand gen standpoint. So we tried something, which was, okay, do you want to do this? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll do it. I don't know what it means, um, but we'll figure it out. Uh, I live two quarters ahead, Q plus one, Q plus two. I'm looking at creation and progression of opportunities to make sure that we're going to be in great shape going into the next quarter so that our CRO, Shane Cumming, can be 100% focused on the right now, getting deals progressed through this quarter to a point of closure this quarter. Uh, and it's working really nicely. You would think, you would think uh, that this would be an opportunity for a lot of friction. Um, I do have one-on-ones with salespeople, uh, but it hasn't been, and it, I don't think it's going to be. We're aligned uh, both uh, through the end goal of the business uh, and our compensation to make this seamless. And, and we've managed to do that. We also think that uh, from a personality standpoint, I'm the right person for the future. He's the right person for the now. And it just works. 
you are the person for the future. So <laughs> love that. Now, how long have you been doing that? How long have you had that title and, and put, and how long did it take to put it in place? We started this mid year 2020. Okay. Um, and I, I would say for the first six months, we weren't really sure what we were doing yet. And I did reach out. There is a, another person um, on LinkedIn with the title chief pipeline officer. And I reached out to that person works at PTC um, and got some ideas as to what he was working on. Um, but a lot of this was just feeling it out and progressively getting more detail, more data to, to paint a number of different stories and to identify what we care about and how we're going to measure the success of, of not just the role, but the company. So, and that's perfect. So uh, let's talk about the metrics that are particularly important on this. I mean, I can sort of guess on a pipeline, obviously we're talking about qualified leads that salespeople or opportunities, whatever you want to call them, that salespeople can follow up on and close. So, but let's talk about what, you know, sort of the metrics that go into your, your pipeline. So the thing that that I care about the most is sales velocity. And sales velocity is a, a piece of fancy math. Um, it's the number of opportunities entering the pipeline times the average deal size times the win rate over the average sales cycle length. So I'm trying to drive up our sales velocity. And the way that we look at sales velocity is measured in dollars per day. It doesn't really matter what the number is to me. I mean, it does. If it was $1,000 a day, it'd be amazing. Uh, I mean, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. It would be amazing. Um, but what I care about is direction. I'm looking for this number to go up quarter over quarter. And the way that you do that in execution with the sales organization is by putting more opportunities in their pipeline. And I have some control over that because I also have the marketing organization. So they're a lever for this. Um, what can we be doing to put more qualified leads into the sales organization's hands to turn those into uh, valued opportunities? Um, then from an average deal size standpoint, what are we doing with product marketing, with content marketing to create um, greater awareness and premium and drive the ability to price higher? Can we, can we add more value? Can we, can we help customers to understand ROI better? So again, I have a lever that I can use with that. From a win rate standpoint, I mean, again, we've got to progress deals. So are we moving deals at a responsible rate? We've set some SLAs around how long deals should sit in different stages. Uh, we're doing exceptional reporting on a monthly basis. That's the meetings that I have with the sales organization uh, where we go through their pipeline and, and look at those deals that aren't progressing. Uh, and then all that comes down to, obviously, uh, that progression helps to drive the sales, uh, sales cycle length. And so each piece of this one at a time can be chipped away to increase that velocity over time. So I've got, and I want to make sure I would repeat the formula uh, and, and maybe Melissa, if you're paying attention you can put it in chat, if we, we get this or uh, 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 share it. So it's the number of opportunities times the average deal size times the win rate divided by average sales cycle length, average sales cycle. Um, okay. And so obviously, once you start doing this, you have normative data on all of it. Uh, and so the variables as number of opportunities go up, that's better. As a deal size goes up, that's better. And as win rate goes up, that's better. And then the sales cycle, if they get longer, that's a problem. <laughs> right, exactly. So everything is great unless we're not impacting, for instance, like you say, sales cycle length. Like, so we're, doing, we're putting more in the pipeline. Great. Fantastic. We're winning more deals. Great. But it's taking us a really long time to do it. That's a thing that we need to understand and we need to impact change around. Now, one other thing is that we're looking at all this data on an annualized basis. So we do a rolling four quarters model. So it's not just a quarter at a time. We're looking at a full 12 months worth of data um, on a repetitive basis to, to understand these trends, to uncover um, the trends that we want to try and impact. So you picked a good one, um, sales cycle length from a new logo standpoint. It's not decreasing the way that we'd like it to. Everything else is, I'm seeing more opportunities coming to the pipeline. I'm actually seeing a, a higher average deal size. Um, our conversion rate is increasing, but if it continues to take us a really long time, 
that's a challenge that we need to overcome. And uh, what I'm as I'm thinking about all this data, I'm wondering who's crunching this for you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you. Um, <laughs> Uh, my my data analyst is my boss, um, is my CEO. Uh, I have a CEO that loves to play with numbers. Um, and um, he is creating some amazing visualizations uh, that I use to do my job. I've got an open rec um, inside our, our central operations organization to replace him. He knows this. Um, but neither one of us look forward to the day that that happens. It's uh, it's really great. So if I'm and just and quickly because then we will then move on to Tara. But so as a marketer now, I mean, are you really just looking at what can I do to drive increase opportunities, increase average deal size, increase win rate, and that's where you're spending a lot of your time? Because you you've got as the pipeline guy, I could see that you could spend all your time on these four variables, and. And yet marketing is hard to break down into those variables. It's definitely making me think differently about the things that I'm working on. So we're coming into a year where we're going to be experiencing some aggressive growth. And I mean, we've talked in the huddles about spending on awareness and measuring awareness spend. And when I think about awareness spend now, really, I'm, the way that I'm going to measure it is in the ease of progression through early stage of the pipeline. If we are better known, if the category that we inhabit, which I'll be marketing for, is better known, should we be able to get a meeting easier? Yeah. So should I be filling the opportunity pipeline faster? Um, do we need to explain ourselves as much in the interest phase? Right. We shouldn't need to. People should have a better idea of who we are. So should, we should move faster there. So all of these things that, that we do in marketing, I mean, there's the obvious piece that's the content marketing, content syndication, all the demand gen, the events that we do, all of that feeds directly into this model. But the things that I wasn't thinking about actually feed into it as well, um, all of which is, again, created so that we sell more business faster. Okay. I love all this, and we will come back to this, but let's bring on uh, Tara Robertson, the CMO of Teamwork. Hello, Tara. Hi, thanks so much for Car. having me. Thank you for being here. And uh, you are, what, what, you're up in Northwest Vermont? North, where, where are you? Northern Vermont, yep, right up in the mountains, covered in snow. Wow, that sounds nice. Uh, now, I know that 2021 was your first year at Teamwork, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how you approached metrics and, and you know, what, what, who'd you work with and, and what was in place and what you need to put in place? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, I have to, have to say, Chris is the future. That was great. I felt like I learned so much and was nodding along, had a couple laugh out loud moments. So um, that was a great session to start off. Definitely, you know, a good one to follow on. Um, so obviously, when I first came in, and I've been here for almost a year, a year in February, um, it's really just coming in and getting to understand what exists to learn and to, you know, drink from the fire hose as quickly as I possibly can, and then start to figure out how we want to drive and make the impact. Um, definitely for everything that Chris said through and through revenue is the number one thing. And I'd say when I first came in, marketing was not responsible for revenue and was not looking at revenue. It was more the traditional trials and MQLs. And then there was a break and then sales took over at the SQL stage and reported on the revenue. Um, so that was probably the first thing that we worked on is looking at understanding all of the different channels that we were doing, how those channels were driving revenue impact so that we could make you know, decisions not just based off of what looked like was driving quantity, but instead what was driving better quality and then refining a lot of the dashboards that we had to better understand all of the different components of the marketing engine. Okay. Well, you've used... and I, So... Revenue drives me crazy as a metric, and and, and I, I talk about this in the book and why I think it's so problematic from a marketer, because it's it represents something that happens a year after we got this first contact going. It ha There's so many things that marketing can do along the way, and it's a lagging indicator. It's not a right. It's not something that you can use any time until a close go. Oh, and then you have to go back and try to do some kind of attribution and who cares, right? 
I mean, in some sense, we just, yes, we need net new logos. And I'm not saying that revenue doesn't matter. I just struggle. And I know lots of CMOs struggle with if we make that the metric that we mm. hold our team accountable for, what are they doing in the 12 months before that revenue comes in? And how yeah. are they looking at things? And so tell me how you've sort of sorted that through and solved the problem that clearly you don't have that I do. <laughs> well, I, I think we're probably in a different unique scenario in where our entire business starts as product led. And so uh, we have a 30 day sales cycle for any net new trials and every single lead comes in as a trial. And so as it stands when I first joined to even right now, and we are diversifying this, we are starting to enter into having a more lead generation, demand generation, um, or even demo request engine. It really didn't exist. And I do feel very lucky in that I entered into an already very robust marketing engine that was generating thousands of trials on a monthly basis. And so we can predict fairly quickly if those will turn into revenue within a 30 day sales cycle. Right. Um, the other part is I would say, what's unique about teamwork is that since joining, marketing actually owns a component of revenue for the business. And so we've got essentially two funnels. One is our self-serve. And so anyone that is of a small enough size that comes in, goes through our product-led motion, but maybe doesn't require human intervention, marketing owns that end-to-end. -end. And so we have a revenue number, we have to drive that. And as a result, um, we look at all of the indicators. So instead of an MQL, a marketing qualified lead, we look at PQL, so product qualified leads, and work very, very closely with our product team on understanding what are the indicators that show us that this person will convert into a paid customer and then work on optimizing that. So that's part of the marketing revenue engine that um, we own end to end completely that our team is responsible for. Then we also have a sales assisted motion, but again, that sales assisted motion, 99% of the revenue comes from a marketing trial or marketing efforts. And so um, we can very quickly attribute to what campaigns are working, what essentially is driving the most impact or the higher um, contracts that we're looking for as a whole in a very short time period. So as we start to diversify that more, I think to your point, we definitely need to start adding in a lot more of looking at longer sales cycles or more pipeline as a part of it. I love the idea of a chief pipeline officer. Um, and that's definitely something that we've added in is understanding the pipeline so we can start to see where the bigger deals are even coming from. But our window for revenue is it's a lot smaller. So it's easy for us to predict that quickly. Yeah. And and this is why I said at the top of the show that this metrics thing, generalizing metrics for B2B is so hard. If you are product led, first mm -hmm. of all, you know, as you said, you can point to 98, you know, 90 plus percent of, of revenues coming through marketing. Yay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a good number. Yeah. Uh, so that's part one of this. Um, Plus, you have that free trial product, which mm -hmm. sort of gets people, you know, try before you buy. It's wonderful. So then it's really a question of, one, how well the product itself converts, building in conversion things into the product, and then whatever else. And then, of course, that's sort of, that's the revenue part of it. And then there's just the, how do you get more of those self-serve people in there? Uh, so that's cool and very different than other companies uh, that don't that aren't product led but let's talk about then you mentioned dashboard before I challenge mm -hmm. you on revenue what's on your dashboard and have you know I try to get this down in my book I get it down to eight metrics I'm curious what metrics are on your dashboard yeah and I think there's so there's two really that I'm looking at outside of what marketing um, handles and so on the marketing side we're certainly measuring both the self-serve revenue dashboard and then the sales assisted because they have very different buyers motions um, and so if I'm talking about self-serve we're really everything starts at traffic and this is for both sides and so we'll look at you know all of your indicators from traffic to trial um, PQL so product qualified leads we actually look at for both product led and sales assisted because on the sales assisted side, it's a very strong indicator for us on propensity to buy. Um, and on the sales side, we then get into pipeline. You know, there's the, you know, of course, MQL to SQL. But what I really care about is um, our sales qualified opportunities, which is essentially the pipeline. How right. many of those are coming in and show us that they're not just hitting a box or checking off the MQL. MQL is important because it's an indicator for us, but it is not the number that is the tried and true 
we know we were successful. Once we see it move to that sales qualified opportunity or that pipeline stage, then we're feeling really great about it. Um, and then of course, for us, there's that revenue output as a whole. And so I'd say on the sales assisted dashboard, um, we look at that not just within marketing, but marketing, sales, and then also product on a weekly basis so that we're all going in and looking at all of our conversions, the indicators, and the, the high level of are we achieving what we're looking at week over week, but then also projecting what the quarter will look like together. Um, on the sales or on the self-serve side, it's actually a lot easier because for us, it's really getting into just traffic to trials to PQLs, and then that indicates to us if they will end up turning into revenue in general. And so that will, of course, cascade into all of our individual teams and their responsibilities on conversion. But those are probably the things that I look at. Um, and of course, on the executive team level, it's understanding our ACV or average contract value, understanding our net new logos, and then our run rates for all of the different um, revenue components we're looking to drive. That's a lot. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna bring on Carl Vandenberg, uh, CMO of Gigamon. Thank you for that, Tara. And uh, Carl uh, actually is the star of episode two sixty four of Renegade Marketers Unite. Hello, Carl. Hey, Drew. Happy New Year, and great to uh, see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Now you've been at Gigamon three years, and I'm just curious: has how has your approach to measurement and metrics evolved over the last three years? Yeah, uh, this is, and I see this as like a primary role for the modern CMO because our metrics and it's a great conversation are continuing to evolve. Um, and we need to take the organization and the investors and the executives along with that uh, on that journey. So, um, uh, year one, really, uh, and for those who don't know Gigamon, you know, we're kind of a B2B complex, uh, fairly complex sales cycle, about a half billion dollars in size. And so uh, the technology. Uh, it requires a 12 to 18 month sales cycle. And so the, the the company was really product and sales led. And so when I came on board, it was really to start up the, the marketing engine, grow the marketing contribution. So clearly contribution to pipeline was the primary metric we were driving towards in, in year one. We built, of course, the traditional funnel, the inside sales engine, and all of the metrics that uh, that the audience will be familiar with from you know leads down to uh, opportunities uh, and pipeline, I said, being the primary metric um, sourced by marketing. Uh, as we moved into the second year, we uh, we started evolving our ABM practice, and so ABM metrics um, became the uh, the focus for us, in addition to the to the source pipeline. And uh, ABM metrics, uh, I'll be interested in uh, you know when when we have a discussion, the opportunity to discuss. I'll be interested in what the audience. Uh, fields is the, the right metrics for ABM because we've we've looked uh, at the different uh, ways to measure it. Uh, but we we measure it at sponsor engagement, uh, pipelines and bookings lift from the cohort versus the non-cohort. So that's how we, we, we measure that. And then as we moved into year three, um, we started to continue to push the accountability. Uh, and I know you're not going to like this <laughs> direction, accountability down to bookings. Um, uh, I didn't want to take a bookings number, but to have a bookings ROI, which is more of a trailing four quarter, um, because that's easier to manage, uh, trailing four quarter, uh, investment, uh, you know, over the, uh, the, the bookings, a uh, return from that investment. So, so that's kind of, um, year three. And as we go into this year, we're expanding that to bookings, um, assist or assist marketing ROI assist. Um, which is not just sourced a new logos and new buying centers, but where are we assisting the deal? And there, we have our definition of what that looks like. It's not influenced uh, uh, because that's a little bit too broad, but it's right. assisted. And okay, so I, I just want for the record, revenue is awesome. Let's face it that every CEO is looking to their CMO to drive revenue. And I didn't want to say that that isn't important. It is and any CMO who can't translate what they're doing into revenue in one way or another is, as a problem. So I, I, I get it. It's just as the metric, if we all are looking at that, then uh, it's, it, to me, it's just such a problem because you know whatever we've landed in this quarter happened as a result of efforts that you did 18 months ago to get it in there. And, and so it's just, it's very hard to build your 
team and adjust based on that, right? It's hard to make decisions based on that. Uh, and I, I actually wrote a, uh, an article in Forbes called Stop the ROI Obsession. And so that speaks to that problem that we've got a little bit too fixated on that metric. Okay, so we are in agreement there. The other thing I did want to mention is that for uh, CMO huddles, we do have an uh, ABM bonus huddle where we're going to talk about that. And, and John Russo is leading it. And, and John is still a fan. He says, there's still a place for MQLs and I can't wait to get on him on that one. Uh, even though I have been uh, corrected by at least one CMO of why that, that matters. Okay, um, I want to sort of, there are a couple of things I wanted to dig in on. In in first of all, it, when you did, did you build the inside sales team, and do they report to you? They they don't. That was a separate. Okay. Uh, and in fact, it's unique, uh, at least to my knowledge, in that it uh, that team reports directly up to the president. Oh wow! So it's in between. So sales reports to the president, marketing reports to the president, and this team reports to the president. Okay. Yeah, so it's normally under sales or marketing, and this is kind of it's in Switzerland, and actually works really well. Okay, um, and let's talk about. I know that you. I mean, one of the things we talked a lot about in, in the podcast episode was um, your new product, uh, Hawk, and how that played out. And I'm curious with that. I'm imagining there was a whole new set of metrics. Yeah, so um, the as as a company uh, that that uh, move into the cloud or more aggressive move into the cloud, um, uh, there's a whole new metrics related to the product, um, and the we're we're measuring um, petabytes of of process cloud traffic, which is something we weren't measuring before as a company. Specific to marketing, um, we of course track the traditional funnel because we have a campaign specifically around. Uh, that product offering, and so we track the, the sort of the campaign metrics. The um, but because it is category creation, there's more emphasis, and Chris alluded this on the awareness side of things. So we we do track awareness more um, uh, more broadly. But there's a lot of attention on the leading indicators. Are we creating the right engagement with the analysts? Uh, are we getting the pickup and the press? Are we influencing the right? Um, cloud uh, influencers, uh, getting their mind share, et cetera. So more emphasis on the awareness component uh, in addition to the demand component. And let's talk about that. So uh, when we get, when we look at awareness metrics uh, and one which I am a, a big fan of and creating blended awareness metrics, because if we go back to Ross Graber and the session that we did in huddles on on metrics, what he talked about were opportunities and share of opportunities, right? And so if there are only five opportunities and you're not in any of them, you have a problem. Or let's, let's say there's a hundred. Uh, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering about that. So, you know, and that probably applies to Gigamon, right? There's a certain number of companies that are in the market for what it is you're serving any given year, right? But I imagine for Hawk, and this is where I was curious, how do you look at um, when you're in the category creation mode, how do you sort of get beyond this, you know, the, the, you're creating the opportunity, <laughs> right? There's nobody out there buying. That's what category creation is. Right. So, so anyway, I just asked like five questions in one. Let's just talk about what the difference is and how you're measuring awareness. We'll start there. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, to your question on on the sort of the, how do you quantify the 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 opportunity uh, in the market, um, the way that we do that uh, both for our traditional offering as well as our newer offering is we've created this high propensity target model. We talked a little bit about that when when I was on here last, um, and that model is um, partly mach machine learning based on the data that we have because we have a number of cloud customers already. So extrapolating from that. Um, and then part of it is, you know, tops down uh, intel that we have, uh, data that we put into the model. So using that, we know the number of accounts in the universe that are potential buyers, right? So, so then it starts with how, what percentage of those accounts, it's like the ABM metrics, what percentage yeah. of those accounts are we engaging? So it is an opportunities, it's share of opportunities. Yeah. And, and, and that makes a lot of sense. It, it, and to me, I can wrap my mind around it. If there are a hundred buyers out there and you only are in five of them, you have an awareness problem. 
If you're right. in 80 of them, you have a you may have a different and you're not closing them, then you have a different problem. You have a pricing problem, a product problem, or something else. Okay. All right. All this is amazing. Wow, what an action-packed 30 minutes. We're going to now, I'm going to sort of take a second and talk about uh, CMO Huddles, uh, which is sort of the source of all this goodness here. Uh, we launched CMO Huddles in 2020. It's an invitation-only subscription service that brings together an elite group of CMOs to share, care, and dare each other to greatness. One CMO described huddles as timely conversations with smart peers in a trusted environment, while another called it a cross between an expert workshop and a therapy session. So since we have three huddlers here, I just, you know, if, uh, how does this match? Uh, uh, Chris, Tara, Carl, how does this match with your experience? I yeah. can hop in first. Oh, good. Um, Great. Yeah. Uh, definitely my experience. I mean, I think one, the huddles themselves are fantastic. It's a closed conversation where you can just get in and talk about all the things going on. And like you said, it's sometimes a good therapy session for people that you just know get it and are in the weeds and doing the same things that you're doing day to day. Um, but also to really get new ideas or new thinking into the way that you're attacking your job. It can often be a pretty lonely spot to be the CMO within your organization with a lot of what we carry. So it's just great to have that place to connect with others. And then I think also, Drew, what's been so great is some of the personal connections. And so spending time saying like, here's the challenge that I need to dig into and then having other people connected with you to just pick your brains each other um, with each other, that's been you know invaluable in so many different ways to how we're tackling the jobs day in and day out. I love it, I love it. Um, Chris. You know, I mean, I agree with all of that. And I think you know, for me, we're all moving so quickly. I don't necessarily know the things that I'm not thinking about all the time. Mm -hmm. And having topics brought to me, this is something that we're going to talk about, um, is is helping to expand what I'm doing in my business. Um, things that are just, you know, someplace else out of my out of my reach, out of my eyesight are popping into it on a monthly basis um, and having direct impact on my business. Very cool. All right. Well, Carl, anything on anything to throw in there? Yeah. So I uh, I love them. The, the, the few that I've been on, um, I think it's it allows me to take a pulse on what's going on in the market um, and uh, sort of evolve thinking. It's also uh, confirmation uh, at times of decisions that we're making. And then I would say the last piece is uh, it's good benchmark data uh, for for the executive team, investors, and, and things that we're deciding to do. Love it. All right. Well, cool. So if you're listening and you're a B2B CMO that can share and care and dare with the best of them, visit cmohuddles.com or hit me up on LinkedIn to see if you qualify for a guest pass. We just have, uh, oh, now, wait, let's see. Oh, now, time to move on to the gin tasting. Um, we have some recorded comments while we go grab our gin. So come back and we'll be tasting some gin and talking more about metrics that matter. You know, a smart person learns from their mistakes. A wise person learns from other people's mistakes. There's great value in this CMO model. This one has consistently brought value to the table. There's value at every step. The continuity of familiar faces is also quite nice. You can start to form your relationship. It's a nice break in your week from um, a lot of other mediums. You know, none of us is as smart as all of us. Every huddle I go away with one idea that I didn't know before. We have implemented a number of things that have made a significant amount of difference. It's a really high caliber group of very passionate CMOs. Share these best practices, but do it in a circle of trust. It's an amazing group of people. Jackie has constantly reminded me that we need a call action on everything we do. So if you are a CMO that can share and care and dare with the best of them, um, visit cmohuddles.com. How's that for a call to action, Jackie? All right. Okay, Melissa, let's uh, let's go with the tasting here. Hi, everyone. Let me just bring everyone back in. You all got your gins in time? It got it in. Arrived this morning. Amazing. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so today we're having a taste off between two new wave gins. New wave in that they were both created and released in the early, late, or around 2007, 2008. So we're gonna be tasting New Amsterdam and Nika Coffee Gin. Let's start with New Amsterdam, one that you may be a little bit more familiar with. Um, go ahead and pour your sample. I'll tell you a little bit about it. So New Amsterdam Gin is actually made by EJ Gallo Winery in Modesto, California. 
um, which I found very surprising. I didn't know that they had such a, a well-known gin in the States. Um, and the name of it is a nod to Jin's great, great grandfather, Genevieve. So the Dutch had a liqueur that, or they still do, that's made with juniper. It was used like for medicine. And when the British were over fighting the 30 years war, they saw Dutch soldiers drinking um, Genevieve for their Dutch courage. And it eventually came over to England, was popularized by William of Orange. And now we have gin as we know it today. So this one should be more citrus forward than juniper heavy. Is it a bit easier to sip than? Hmm. I, you know, I have to say, and I'll, I'll help you out. I've, we've, we've had this on the show before, and I'm always reminded how easy this is to drink straight. Because it's so, the lemony, citrusy thing just makes it really smooth. There's no pushback at all. Um, and it is one of those where you don't even, bother uh but it's and it's a very reasonably priced gin hmm. what do you yeah. think well i'm not a gin drinker so but i'm uh so um i actually like this which is surprising me and um i agree it's kind of that citrusy doesn't have that noxious for me more juniper -y. maybe that's going to be the other one uh so um i like it that's that's interesting because the thing that I miss a little bit is that juniper heavy <laughs> okay. taste to it. Yeah, you like gin then, right? You, yeah. If you're really a gin fan, fan yeah. this is is yeah. this is what I will call a gin light. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little taste of summer. Um, yeah, gin and tonics on the beach, um, but this is super drinkable. Like this is this is a yeah. thing you could sit and just sip for a while. I got to get at the coffee. I got to yeah. just dry this. Yeah. Okay. That's great that you see that as the light version of gin because I read a review and Nika coffee is the IPA of gin. So go <laughs> ahead and pour your sample there. Um, I don't like and beers, so this will be. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, this is a Japanese beer and Japanese the, coffee, beer. the coffee part of it is not actually coffee as you would drink in the morning. It's Coffee, the last name of an Irishman named Aeneas Coffee. He developed the very first continuous still in, in the 1800s. And the coffee still was, that still was brought to Japan by Nika Distillery's founder. And after they make the whiskey, they'll make the gin in it as well. Um, so this one has a lot more botanicals in it. It should be much more of an experience when you drink it, something that you will taste on your tongue and still taste in a different way after you've swallowed it. What, what do you think, think Tara? That was my Tara. experience with it too. Like it was a lot stronger this time around than the first one. The first one, it's interesting, Chris, you kind of said reminds you of the summer. Like the first one reminded me of the summer because it was so citrusy and sweet and easy to go down. This one was like, oh, and that is straight up alcohol. <laughs> it's good, and I like it, and I want to throw some tonic water and keep drinking it. Yeah. Um, definitely a lot stronger. Anybody else? What? So uh, uh, do we have a face off here? Any any preference now? Well, again, we're doing something unusual where we're drinking gin straight. I mean, even in a martini dry, you might throw a little vermouth in there. Um, and I'm on Pacific time, so it's 1.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I'm doing dry January, so, you know, I'm not really I screwed up. Too. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. It's January now. It's we're January. Doing great. We're doing great, guys. Yeah, we're doing great. <laughs> we made it all of six days. Well done. Uh, well done. Yeah, but this is it. I only do it on this show, and I won't have anything else. But uh, mm -hmm. interesting. I, in terms of my next martini, it's Nika all the way. There's no doubt. I mean, I, I wouldn't waste, uh, I don't think I'd do a martini with New Amsterdam. Just why bother? Um, right. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't have that much interesting things going on. It's very pleasant. It's almost like soda. <laughs> but uh, Nika's got all sorts of things going on. And I noticed here, one of the botanicals is kabo kabosu. What the heck is that, Melissa? So kabosu, kabosu, which I can't pronounce either, is one of four Japanese citruses in the gin. Um, it's like a small green citrus that's very sour. It's used as an alternative in a lot of Japanese dishes. And fun fact, the famous Shiba Inu, Inu the doge meme dog, is actually named kabosu, kabosu <laughs> <laughs> because um, the owner thought that the dog's face looked like the fruit. There you go. All right. Uh, do we have a winner? Anybody? Okay. All those who uh, prefer New Amsterdam, raise your hand. 
Oh, okay. Does that mean we prefer Nika as the winner here? It, yeah, it's just out of interest. Yeah. Just, it's not boring. It's very interesting. It's not yeah. boring. <laughs> it's got a lot going on. I, if it wasn't dry January, I'd really be looking forward to my martini tonight. Okay. <laughs> Melissa, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. All right. So we've been now, we've been, we're done measuring, Jen. We're now going to get back to marketing metrics. And a lot of huddlers have struggled to nail down attribution. And this is a really, tough topic. And I'm curious how you all are doing and, and what's going on when you think of attribution. I know, Tara, it's, it's a little easier for you because you, you're product led. So I'm going to pick on, on Chris and Carl a little bit. How are you doing when it comes to attribution? And is that something that matters? Um, it does matter. Uh, it doesn't matter for the sake of justifying what we do. Um, we we don't do the whole sales and marketing divide of who created what and why. That's not why I care about attribution. I'm not trying to prove the value of, of me and my team. I'm trying to prove the value of the campaigns and tactics that we use. Um, and you know, for the first several years that we were here, uh, we were really just primarily first touch. And it worked to some extent because we did have a direct line between the lead, uh, the BDR handoff and the sales rep. But as our process is getting more evolved, uh, that first touch doesn't tell the story that I need it to. Um, and so trying to evolve that into a, a multi-touch model and then bringing in data from outside places like demand base uh, for engagement to try and tell that full story is, is kind of right where we are right now. Um, and then there's the two models of there's the attribution for new logo, which is like it's a little more obvious and how to do that. And there's the um, attribution for expansion. Right. We don't have a direct line from lead to BDR to seller from an expansion standpoint. And yet I'm running expansion campaigns. How do I, how do I prove that out? And we've, we've built a model to do that this year as well. Interesting. Um, and uh, Carl, how about you in terms of attribution? Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, as you said, it's a, it's a very active question. And um, the, the, for, for us, it was important, uh, especially as we were starting a few years ago, the marketing engine, um, to show the return on investment in that engine. And sourcing was a primary metric. And we, we, we talk about sourcing new logos as well as new buying centers. And those are pretty clean. Uh, so it's a new buying center. I, we had never done business with that unit or that uh, individual or buying group. Um, that's a pretty clean um, uh, metric. And I think that the, the cleanliness, if you will, or the uh, binary nature of metrics are important uh, so that uh, it's easy to measure. The second one, though, is because it doesn't really capture the full value of marketing is the, the assist that I talked about. And... Um, uh, the assist is, is there a meaningful engagement that shows the creation of opportunity or the acceleration of an opportunity or the expansion within an account, right? So those are kind of the, the ways that we look at marketing assist. And I think between those two, you get a fairly good view of the value that's provided by the investment in marketing. Yeah. And I, I think that really is in the last five years, the big, one of the big evolutions is this moving from, hey, hey, sales, here it is, off you go, to this notion that marketing's job doesn't stop until you have a close. Um, Tara, I, 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 I'm sure attribution matters to you, and the more I thought about it. Uh, tell me what you're thinking on that front. Um, two, two fronts. So the first is, you're right, as a product-led motion on the new business side, it's it's a fairly straight line, no matter which way you look at it. And so we still look at first touch attribution. We've we've dabbled into, do we start looking at multi-touch? Do we start weighing a lot of the different things that we're adding in? Um, but it's a lot of work to stand that up, honestly. And so because it's such a straight line, it's easy for us to attribute and to see the return pretty quickly. I'd say where it gets a little bit messier and where multi-touch becomes more important is actually on the other side of the of the close because we're responsible for the new business revenue but also supporting expansion revenue as a software organization and SaaS in general um and so a lot of our marketing team needs to look at attribution differently 
on the way we look at our expansion funnel versus the way we look at new business. So new business is straight line, first touch attribution, expansion. We're focused a lot more on really understanding all of the influence and the different things that our customers are doing across their entire journey to, to really understand what their propensity to grow will look like. Yeah. Well, and that's a perfect sort of segue into the, as, as we're thinking about all these metrics, I'm curious if there's a metrics, a metric that you wish you had <laughs> or, you know, or where the holes you think th there are. And, and, you know, Chris, just curious for you, if you, know, you, you, you built this, uh, this pipeline, is there a metric that you go, Oh God, I just, if I just had that one. Yeah. It's what day was it when you woke up and cared about buying our product? Like, <laughs> That's what I want to know, because if I knew that, there's so much I could take away from that. That's what campaigns were out in flight. What did you see? What did you hear? Who did you talk to? Um, and and that I think that would change everything. But that doesn't exist. So it's it's piecing all of that together as much as possible from you know anecdotal salesperson says that they gain traction, and then tying that back to the engagement. And that's hard. It is really hard. Carl, how about you? On your wish list. Um, my wish list would be uh, a lot of our business goes through the channel, and uh, so we have you know uh, good uh, uh, investment in in MDF, uh, and it's hard to tie back the impact of an MDF program because you kind of lose sight of what happens with the partner until the deal uh, registers, um, and so really tying the effectiveness of MDF campaigns and activities to that return is hard. I'd love to have better visibility into that. Just in case my dad, who's 95, bless his heart, is listening, NDF stands for? Marketing Development Funds. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Marketing Development Funds. Great. Um, and I'm very glad I clarified it because I heard N and you said M. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, speaking of, of, of good hearing, one of the things that I, I we do on this show, don't ask really too much why, is we always ask the question, what would Ben Franklin say? And uh, we've talked a lot about how there are a lot of metrics out there and one could get buried in the metrics. And it's really, as you know, uh, Tara talked about how hard it was to, to for multi-touch attribution. So one of the things that, you know, certainly I preach in the book and is that, you know, you just try to narrow it down and get agreement on a few metrics. So the quote that I want to share from uh, Professor Franklin is, kill no more pigeons than you can eat. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. I am um, <laughs> joking on that idea. Uh, anyway, and it's an homage to the idea that when, when, when it comes to food, life, or metrics, moderation is a wise option. <laughs> All right. Okay. So here we go. We're going to make a case. You get three metrics to increase marketing spend in 2022. What three will you pick? And we'll start with Tara. Three metrics to increase marketing spend. So right, in order to justify an increase in budget. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, traffic is one. Um, trials for sure and pipeline. Traffic, trials, pipeline. That's easy. Chris. Uh, I'm, I'm starting with, with pipeline. Um, and based on the year that we're going to have this year, I'm going to say um, ARR is the second one. Um, because we are launching a lot of new product. So it's not um, thinking product based, specific, product specific ARR. Um, the third one, third one, something to do with awareness. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's unguided um, awareness. Interesting. Okay. And Carl? I would say um, the uh, kind of the awareness or the, uh, top of the funnel target account engagement. So how many of those opportunities back to what we talked about earlier, are we engaging? Um, then uh, pipeline, uh, kind of the handoff point uh, between marketing and sales. And then the third would be new logo acquisition. Net new logo. Okay. All right. Well, um, this is a phrase that I hear and have heard a lot over the last whatever millennial. Uh, if you can't measure it, don't do it. How do you feel about that? 
And let's start with uh, Chris. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I think that. I mean, everything ties back to something. And so we, I want my team to do crazy things. And what I care about is that what comes out of it turns into, let's take leads. Um, I know that you don't like that, the concept of MQLs, but a qualified lead cost me about $90. Go do whatever you want and make it as unmeasurable as you want. But it needs to come back to, did we get the number of leads that we would have expected um, at the price that we would have expected? And that's allowed us to do some really interesting things, not just here, but in past companies that I wouldn't have done. You can't really measure um, the value of a drone flying around San Francisco illegally filming a, a, a sign truck. But if it comes back to $90 a lead, you can. In that case, it didn't. It was really neat. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it didn't work. But that allowed, I mean, it didn't work. And I knew it didn't work because I looked at it in terms of the things that I was going to measure. And uh, we had to then recalibrate and figure out how, how to get value out of a thing that we did. Interesting. Now, I also remember you were talking about in, uh, at one point a uh, some kind of an awareness model goal thing that you have for your team in terms of the way beyond pipeline. Am I making that up? No. Um, so everything's coming back to, I mean, th this is the year that we're hopefully going to pop into a category um, and we're going to spend money around that to create that awareness and, and where we're going to, where we're going to see that, where I, my objective in doing that is making it easier to generate first meetings. So I'm going to see an increase in meetings. If I don't see an increase in meetings, I'm going to wonder why our awareness isn't working. I'm going to see less time spent in early stages of the funnel in the, in the, in the relationship building stage of the funnel. If I don't see that, I'm going to wonder why my awareness isn't working. And this whole model flows all the way through the deal. I'm doing things to lubricate the process. And if the process doesn't get easier, if we don't get faster, and it, again, it comes back to that sales velocity. If I'm not seeing an increase in velocity, I'm wondering why my awareness isn't working because that should be the outcome. Right. If your awareness is going up and your velocity is staying the same or going to decline, something's wrong. Something's wrong. So something's wrong. Okay. I, I'm not going to, but for instance, if I was going to spend money on billboard advertising, I mean, how do you directly tie that back from a B2B standpoint, enterprise purchase, not transactional? How do I tie that to value? How do I get an ROI out of that? Who even knows? I'm sure that somebody could sell me something that would they could tell me a story about it, but re really, it's lubricating that sales process. And if velocity is not increasing, it's probably not working. Interesting. Okay. Um, Tara, on that, if you can't measure it, don't do it. Where are you? I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> um, I agree so much with what Chris is saying. Um, and I think Carl even said this earlier. As marketers, sometimes people get so stuck in trying to measure every single thing that we do that we're missing the big picture and the more important component of, you know, are we doing the thing that we're setting out to do? For me, that's often looking at our cost of acquisition to our lifetime value of our customers. And as long as that is staying stable and moving in the right direction, we're driving revenue, we're driving pipeline. There are certain components that no matter how hard you try to slice and dice it, you just can't draw a straight line to measure. Billboards is a great example of that, but that's so valuable in the sales process. It's so valuable in the awareness process. So we do have awareness goals that we have in our brand dashboard. We have a separate budget for brand. I know we've talked about that in huddles as well. Um, and that budget does go to sometimes knowing that there's going to be some areas that you just can't track to ROI. But as long as our cost of acquisition to lifetime value and uh, what we're driving from a pipeline perspective stays on trend with our goals, we're in a solid situation. Right. Yeah, it makes a, it makes a lot of sense. So, um, Carl, I'm curious if there are any technologies that you've implemented that have really helped you when it comes to tracking the metrics that matter. <clears throat> um, so, uh, uh, I, I we we centralize data warehouse in the cloud. Uh, uh, we use uh, Microsoft Stack. That's kind of the 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 uh, and you know built in house. Um, and I want to just add a comment though on the um, I'll be a little bit contrarian on the last question. Uh, the 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 in saying that 
Um, I do believe, and Peter Drucker had something similar, I guess, the uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. However, I do agree with the, the team here. It's not about necessarily the return on investment, because you can't always track, but return on some form of objective from the activity, right? And so, um, and that was, I alluded to, to the Forbes article, that was essentially the case I was making is like, look for some measurable outcome, right? It doesn't have to be revenue related, but some measurable outcome that you can know whether it's successful or not based on the premise which you started uh, and defined the, the activity. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I completely agree with that notion. I think the, the, the gap happens when the CMO says, we're measuring this by awareness lift. And the CFO says, well, I can't eat awareness. So that's not a metric that I can accept. Yeah. And this is where, yeah, I could measure it, but it didn't matter <laughs> to the CFO. And this is where your world is, is so darn, so darn tricky. Um, uh, Chris or, or Tara, any technologies that you've used that have been helpful from a from this metrics or anything new that you're you're using to um, to measure? Not not over here. Uh, I am primarily pulling data into Power BI and building out custom visualizations. I if there's anything out there that works better than that, I'd love to know what it is. Same over here. I mean, we build a lot of it in-house in working with our data team. With um, We've got a cross-functional revenue operations team that's visualizing a lot of the data that we're trying to look at. Um, one thing that we're super excited right now, um, Chris, similar to you, our CEO loves to live in the data and look at it on an ongoing basis and is working with us on building a predictive model so that we can understand based on certain campaigns that we're running from paid, can we predict out if they'll be successful when we're testing new things out? And that is awesome. Um, there's a lot of technologies out there that we've used, but in most companies I've worked for, working within your own data and then maybe using using a visualization tool um, in order to look at those dashboards has often been you know, the better way to get there. Yeah. Okay, so we are wrapping this up. Um, Amazing conversation. And I'm just going to give each of you sort of one minute for final words of wisdom to your fellow CMOs on finding the metrics that matter for their companies. And we'll start uh, We'll start with Chris. Okay. I mean, I, I just think that digging into the pipeline, I, you would think that the sales organization would push back on this conversation coming from me and where I sit. And it hasn't been that way. It's, it's really been very well accepted. And the idea of bringing them through forensically through their pipeline on a monthly basis to help them to, to see where they have soft spots has been incredibly valuable to the business. And now we're in a position where we're essentially calling our shots. Uh, we're hitting our numbers. We're walking into next quarter, ready to do business um, in a healthy position from a pipeline standpoint. And that's really what we need to do. We just need to be able to execute. We know how to do that moving forward. And we, we know how to scale that. And it's a great place to be. There you go. All right. Uh, Tara, final words of wisdom. I agree. Pipeline through and through is critically important, especially in a sales motion. I guess the other thing I would add is know what's important to your fellow colleagues or your executive team. Work with your CEO, work with your CFO, your CRO, whomever it is that your partner is, and understand what they really want to see and know from a marketing perspective, because that helps when it comes to looking for the budget and where you're driving in. And so as long as your own dashboard measures up to whether it's pipeline, whether it's revenue, but something that drives incremental impact on the business, but that you're also reporting on the things that are important to the people that are signing off on your budget, um, you're in a solid shape. Amazing. Okay, Carl, bring us home. All right, agree uh, with both uh, Chris and Tara on theirs. I would add that um, you know the the making sure we carve out some measure that yes gets alignment and understanding and appreciation uh, around awareness and brand because that often when you know push comes to shove can get shortchanged and so I think that's super important for the long time uh, uh, value of the business. And then the, the other piece is, I think it's a journey because metrics will evolve as the business evolves and the market evolves, right? And the strategies evolve. And so part of our job is staying on top and staying ahead of that and educating our executives and uh, our investors. 
It is a perfect place because we are just going to constantly be evolving these things. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, Tara, Carl. You're all great sports and amazing guests. I thank you, audience, for staying with us. Please join us in two weeks when we'll be back talking about growth marketing with Jennifer Houston, Gary Savants, and Catherine Calvert. Let's cue the music. Renegade Marketers Live is produced by Melissa Caffrey for show notes, past episodes, and the latest on my new book, Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands. Please visit renegade.com. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, and until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.